Having a baby used to be a straightforward proposition. You could have a boy or you could have a girl. But now there's a third option. It's called steep civilizational decline. Oh my goodness. Everyone is dressed so nice. I wish I would have worn a nice costume for y'all. A visitor who usually performs for an older audience. My name is Blackberry. I'm a bearded drag queen. That means I'm a lady with lots of facial hair. Do you want to touch my hair? No. This program is geared towards kids 10 years old and younger. I just want to expose them to things they don't get to see every day and want it to become the more normal and more accepted. They've never seen a drag queen before, so I thought it was a good chance to see one. A handful of parents across America are deliberately keeping their children's sex hidden and instead raising so-called babies. The idea is that only the children themselves should be able to decide whether they are boys or girls without any of that pesky biological reality getting in the way. It's all very confusing like a lot of 2018 is. Let me hear my cats. Of course, a love of books, too. Blackberry says reading is a way to break the stigma of drag in queer culture. That's the whole goal, is to uh, make kids that aren't used to seeing something like me uh, more comfortable to seeing it. I start them young, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of smiles there. It's about not necessarily labeling the baby. It's about allowing the baby to decide what gender that baby wants to be when that baby can decide, which is around four years old. For, so from zero to four, the baby will not be labeled. The labeling theory will not apply from zero to four years old. The baby will be a baby, neither a boy nor a girl. And from lace front wigs <clears throat> to dazzling illusions, it's the competition that has plenty of energy sweat and a whole lot of glitter. Oh. RuPaul's Drag Race is the reality oh. show embracing all shapes and sizes. Who was your inspiration when you were younger? Who did you look at and go, I want to be like them? I actually thought I had invented drag. I was like, <laughs> I would be the first little boy to stars all the fabulous evil queens. <laughs> and look at me now. And that's your inspiration, <laughs> evil queens. Now, new alleged details about sexual, or rather details, about alleged sexual misconduct by a Catholic cardinal who was a power broker within the church. Shocking allegations coming from the Catholic Church, and this time it hits real close to home. McCarrick was the public face when the U.S. Council of Bishops issued its report about decades of abuse by priests. Here he is on NBC's Meet the Press. Do you believe there's a special place in hell for men who represent Christ on earth? and abuse their flock. There is certainly a special terrible judgment on, on someone who would abuse the trust that a priest must have, that a priest does have. But McCarrick's own behavior became the focus last month when he was removed from the ministry. Making him the highest ranking Catholic official in the U.S. to be removed for sexual abuse of a minor. Now there are more allegations. The New York Times reports that beginning in the 1980s when McCarrick was a New Jersey bishop, he inappropriately touched young adult seminarians. The newspaper said church officials knew of the allegations as he rose in the hierarchy. McCarrick declined to comment to the Times. A new investigation finds other offenses, and church officials allegedly covered them up for decades. With holy oil, you will relieve and console the sick. You will... Cardinal Theodore McCarrick was long one of the most recognized faces of the U.S. Catholic Church. McCarrick became an influential voice at the Vatican and was among the cardinals who elected Pope Benedict XVI. In the early 2000s, Pope John Paul II asked him to help manage the devastating sexual abuse crisis. He was one of the drafters of the Charter for Protecting Children that was adopted by American bishops in 2002. I think when you look at zero tolerance, now I'm saying this, the other bishops aren't, I'm saying zero tolerance prospectively, everybody's on the same page. If this ever happens again, that's it. Father, I think one of the reasons why so many people are, are surprised by these allegations is that he was so... Uh, out front on the, uh, the the abuse scandal against children, uh, and yet this was going on, or at least the allegations were there against him. 
I read an interesting article uh, from Teen Vogue. By the way, I don't subscribe to Teen Vogue. I want you to know. And I hope you don't either. And I hope your children don't. And you'll understand why I say that when you hear what they had in this article. It was an op-ed, and it's uh, an article about some activists who want to use art, quote, to raise awareness about the erosion of reproductive rights. But their emphasis is on humor, and their message is, yes, abortion can be funny. Really? Is that where we're at now? Abortion can be funny? Taking the life of an innocent, unborn children is to some people funny? Yeah, that's the culture we're living in right now. It just seems like we keep moving the goalposts and it gets worse and worse. And when you think it can't get any worse, it gets a little worse. A menacing mailer targets doctors who perform abortions in central Indiana. The anti-abortion group believes their efforts are essential to their campaign. I believe it's totally, totally uncalled for, unfair, unethical. They're talking about this mass mailing to addresses around 64th near Hoover Road, set out by an anti-abortion group, Operation Save America. The mailer from Operation Save America identified a neighbor who provides legal abortion services. We edited the material so on the left side you will not see the doctor's photograph or the image of a fetus. We're also not showing the doctor's home address. The insert claims she murders children and is asking neighbors to pray and tell her to repent. Why do scare tactics like this? The anti-abortion group sent out hundreds of these mailers, targeting two doctors, one female, one male, in central Indiana. The group does not believe it's crossing the line by highlighting a doctor's home address. The issue is not that we sent out material to people's homes. The issue is the nature of what this person does for a living, that they make their money by killing little innocent human beings. That should be disturbing. And I think we get jaded by the barrage of social media we're exposed to every single day. As one writer said, quote, from violence glorifying graphics on the big screen, to incessant headlines of perversion on our news feed, to the latest appalling video on our cell phone, we have become accustomed to the extreme, to the twisted, to carnage, and to gore." End quote. Very true. The Bible warns that we can lose our sensitivity in Ephesians 4.13. The Bible warns that you can have your conscience seared as with a hot iron. Yeah. How does it take you to transform? Well, it takes me three hours to oh. transform. You don't wake up like this. No, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. It just takes a little bit of extra lip gloss. Truthfully, I've been doing drag since I was five years old. Really? People could not keep me out of dresses and heels. I'd take whatever I could get, even an ugly fur boot, if I could find it. Welcome to Drag Queen Story Hour. It's story time at the Woodside branch of the New York Public Library in Queens. Today, the guest reader is larger than life. So this is probably taking place in that service. Nearly 50 children from babies to 10 years old captivated by Miss Harmonica Sunbeam. All genders are alike. The, the boy's brain, the male brain, might be a little larger. The uh, female's language might be a little bit more advanced. Okay, no maybe, sexism but, on my show. Hold on. Whoa, sorry, slow down. No, sorry. here you're out there like they say maybe boys' those brains are, true. are larger. And yeah. I just want to say that kind of toxic masculinity has no place in this program. <laughs> sorry. Thank you very much. But that's all but they no, can look, think the, of. the bottom yeah. line is. Yeah. Yeah, all they could think of, like, difference in brain size, difference in genitalia, Perhaps. difference in bone structure. Perhaps. Just minor things minor. like Just minor, minor, minor. things like that. Yeah. No, yeah. not perhaps. Like, factually. So those are not minor things. Those are definitive things. Minor. So, like, why would you not tell your kids about that? You know, at some point, they're going to drop trout and look down and say, wait, we look different. And you're going to be like, no, you don't. You're exactly the same. And That's that, lying. Who cares about the genitalia? Because who cares? Uh, may, may I just suggest why, and this isn't just my opinion, but the opinion of every person who's ever lived going back, let's just say 10,000 years for the sake of neatness, because men and women are completely different in key ways. Babies? Can we not say that anymore? Babies are different. Babies yeah. are different. They're little, they're yeah, little they are. human beings, and there's really not much of a difference between different genders. No. <laughs> there is no difference, and men and women, right. we would say, right. are equal. I'm trying to laugh so I don't cry. You know what? This seems to be something that's really lacking 
in American culture today. Shame. You know, we celebrate the things we used to be ashamed of. Everything is upside down. Uh, right is wrong. Wrong is right. The Bible says, woe to those who say evil is good and good is evil. And dark is light. And uh, light is dark. And bitter is sweet. And sweet is bitter. It seems like no one wants to be held accountable for their actions anymore. Because now we're a nation of victims. It's never our fault. It's always somebody else's fault. And we have no shame over things that we do when they're wrong. Two Christian women are facing jail time in Arizona for, well, for being Christian and living their Christian beliefs. These two women could be thrown in jail because they declined to participate in a gay wedding ceremony since gay marriage violates their Christian beliefs. The city of Phoenix says that that Christian belief is against the law. The women's names are Joanna Duca and Brianna Kosky, and they own an art studio in Phoenix, a calligraphy studio where they create custom invitations for events such as weddings. But their names and what they do almost doesn't matter here because these two women could be any one of us. They could be you, they could be me. They could be any one of the 173 million Christian adults living in our country, in the United States. Christians who are now under attack by the government for living their Christian faith. The law in the city of Phoenix that could send these women to jail is called an anti-discrimination ordinance and it says business owners can't discriminate against gay people. And that's all good and well, but that's not what's happening with these two women. Nobody is turning gay people away from the store for being gay. A gay man did not walk into the shop and the owner said, oh, sorry, sir, you can't buy anything here because we hate your sexual orientation. Not at all. In fact, the owners of the studio say they're happy to serve gay customers and gay customers can buy anything in their store. But it's a very, very different thing for the government to force these women to participate in a gay wedding since gay marriage violates their Christian beliefs. That's what's at stake here. It boils down to this. Can the government compel speech from these women? Can the government throw these women in jail if they refuse to speak, refuse to participate in something against their religion? Can the government throw these women in jail for being Christian? A judge ruling on this case, Judge Karen Mullins of the Maricopa County Superior Court said it didn't matter that this Phoenix law compels speech, allows government to force citizens to say things the citizens don't want to say. The judge said this kind of speech doesn't count, it's not protected, because it's not, quote, expressive speech. I'm sorry, have you read the First Amendment? Is there an exception for certain kinds of speech that aren't protected? And then one of the ratifiers of the U.S. Constitution, Patrick Henry, made this statement, which is very significant, quote, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded, listen, not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it is for this very reason people of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here, end quote. Very true. And revisionists want to edit that out of our history books, but it's part of our story. 
Some of you are saying, Greg, have you looked at America lately? That we have a lot of problems. Oh, I acknowledge that. I acknowledge the divisions and the problems and the conflicts and all the areas we fall short in. But this is a unique nation. We have spiritual roots. You know, a very important name in the history of America is George, right? George. Is anybody named George here? Any George? That's a good name, George. Now you're immediately thinking of George Washington, and he was our founding father, and we named the nation's capital after him. But I'm not talking at this moment about George Washington. I'm talking about our spiritual founding father, George Whitfield. Ever heard of him? He wasn't even an American. He was from England. And uh, George Whitfield was a great evangelist. So he came over uh, to our shores and preached to the colonists, and many of them came to Christ. In fact, 80% of the people living in the colonies at that time heard George Whitfield preach in person, including Benjamin Franklin. Sometimes as many as 40,000 people would come to hear George Whitfield preach. And thousands and thousands of people came to Christ and a spiritual awakening spread across America. So while France was having a revolution, we were having a spiritual revival. And it was in that soil that the seeds of this experiment, this new concept of a nation was born. One nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all that we say even in our Declaration of Independence, we've been endowed by our Creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we would not be ruled by a monarch on a throne. We would have representatives who would go into our capital and speak for us and with all of the flaws of our system, and there are many, uh, this amazing thing has worked and America was born. But it's alarming that you cannot really find anything that resembles America as we know it today in the last days. Where are we? I don't know. We'll explore that in another message. But in our absence, imagine a world where evil is allowed to spread unabated. A world that ultimately pledges its loyalty to a man that will make Adolf Hitler look like a lightweight in comparison. That is coming to planet Earth. Antichrist will be history's vilest embodiment of sin and rebellion. But he's not going to be what you might expect, you know, dressed head to toe in black with glowing red eyes and steam coming off of him with a Darth Vader song playing in the background when he enters a room. No, I'm telling you, this guy will be charismatic. He'll be magnetic. He'll be a powerful orator. He'll be a convincing speaker. He will be probably a very handsome guy as well. He'll probably be on the cover of GQ and uh, Time Magazine simultaneously. Think the devil wears Prada, right? So who is this Antichrist, also called the Beast, the Wicked One, the Son of Perdition? Well, that brings us to where we last left off here in the book of Daniel. Uh, Daniel saw a vision of a winged lion and a bear and a leopard coming out of the sea in Daniel 7. Remember we pointed out that in the Bible the sea is a picture of the multitudes, the people. And these are not literal animals, they're symbols of nations. Verse 8 says that he speaks pompous words, which means he boasts arrogantly. He's a powerful orator, he'll win people over. He'll bring about a temporary global peace and economic solutions. But here's something else to know about Antichrist. Point number two, he is coming to declare war on believers. But over in 2 Thessalonians 2, 7, it says, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, and now he who restrains will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. So the Bible says, and then that wicked one will be revealed. And I bring that up because there, there are times then when it seems evil is prevailing. It seems like darkness is winning and we're losing. Well, it does seem that way at times. But I've read the last page of the Bible. I'm telling you, we win in the end.